Okay, well, we'll start off, and I'll try to keep it to an hour because uh, your your system automatically kind of falls off the edge, uh, more or less, right at uh, right at 12:02. So, um, my name is Art Nash, and I'm with Cooperative Extension, which is the part of the university that is responsible for providing uh, education out to the general public, folks who aren't necessarily taking credited classes. So there's a number of us who are assistant professors, maybe in food preservation, possibly horticulture. I happen to fall into energy, and by default, I also then end up doing a good amount of housing because uh, a house uh, for most people is their major investment, and whenever you talk about energy efficiency, home efficiency often uh, comes uh, into play. So today, though, I'd like to go over a topic that um, I had slated uh, on the schedule. We'll be going through the end of the month on these Tuesday workshops. I've been doing them just to see how things fly for some of the more remote communities. Uh, today I'd like to cover a little bit about biofuels in Alaska. And I'm going to try to, as best as I can here, bring up uh, a slideshow uh, and try to make sure that you all um, that you all are able to see it. So, unfortunately, um, the way that it's been working is I I've got to uh, just kind of expand the screen of my PowerPoint and can't do a full slideshow. You may need to uh, look uh, fairly closely and and see what you think, um, and then give me some feedback. So. Let me get this rigged up here as best as I can. And I'm going to ask you here in just a moment if you can see me. Um, or rather, and you do have a participant in Seward now, just so you know, Art. Oh, okay, great. You should be able to see Thanks. him when you switch back. Okay, good deal. Okay, so um, let me just get... Okay. So let's see if you can see uh, this PowerPoint presentation. Um, uh, do you see anything yet by chance? Not yet. Okay. How about oh, now? There we go. Okay, now how large is that uh, approximately? Are you able to read the words from where you're at? Yeah, we can read it. Okay. And uh, we're trying to figure out a way of taking up the whole screen. I, I'm not able to tell how much of the screen it takes up for you. But uh, the first thing on biofuels uh, that I want to uh, cover is what had originally got me kind of interested in the topic, uh, looking for uh, fuels uh, other than diesel uh, or petroleum that uh, folks could do specifically uh, home heating from. And a lot of that, of course, is because here in the interior, you know, we just got done with a 45 uh, below, 50 below uh, snap throughout the interior. And though this were, uh, when this winter has been a lot more mild, there are people in Fairbanks who, and it's anecdotal, I haven't taken a survey, but people who I've spoken with who either themselves or know of others who are spending eight grand a winter, eight grand a winter on electricity and, and space heating. And it's hard to separate the two because a lot of times you don't know if the people are using the electricity for the, the heating or whether it's just for lights and then, uh, you know, they are maybe using a little bit of electricity to kick on their boiler. Hard to say. But with those kind, with those, uh, kind of cost outlays, uh, there are folks, and certainly businesses, have decided not to move into Fairbanks um, and have waited to see what will happen to fuel prices. There are folks who have left the interior and gone down to somewhere uh, such as Anchorage. So down in Anchorage, folks will end up paying, uh, I believe, probably about the same as we do for fuel oil. Right now we're probably around $375, 4 bucks a gallon for fuel oil. But the main advantage that they have is that our electricity, and I'm sure you guys uh, won't have too much sympathy because I'm sure yours is most likely higher, we're at 22 and a half cents a kilowatt hour here, and Anchorage is basically right around 10. Now maybe because of hydro, possibly you guys are 
uh, comparative to us. I don't know. Do you know on your electrical bills what you generally pay out? I'll have to look it up. Okay, no problem. I'll look it up. But Anchorage has had for some time some of the cheapest electric in the state, and then it's been able to run off of around 10 cents a kilowatt hour, it, uh, or some of the cheapest in the nation, rather, uh, due to the natural gas and Cook Inlet. And so uh, they've been able to run a lot of even space heating off of electricity because it's powered by cheap natural gas coming out of the inlet. So they often aren't as concerned about some of the alternatives to diesel because natural gas is their alternative to diesel, <laughs> at least on a kind of a community scale basis. Um, so anyway, uh, in getting interested in this, I had, uh, let's see, I'm going to bring it up here and see if I can advance the slides. Uh, I had gone ahead and taken a little uh, survey over the phone of what type of fuels would be the cheapest to operate in Fairbanks. And I was looking just at BTU value, okay? That's the, uh, you know, British Thermal uh, Units takes a look at, I believe, what it takes to uh, raise... Um, uh, raise water one degree Celsius of a certain amount. And so that's kind of the standard is BTUs. So it kind of gives us uh, apples to apples type of equivalent. So as a result, I made up a little um, uh, spreadsheet and then I dumped it onto this chart. And what I found is that if you lived in Fairbanks and taking the average amount of BTUs um, that would come out of, uh, for instance, here, a ton of coal. And then I would uh, make sure that I was talking apples to apples. I would figure out how many pounds to a ton. And I'd figure out how many dollars it would cost um, for that ton. And i divide it by the BTUs. I got this sliding scale that just simply says this. You can get about uh, a 105,000 BTUs at the price of North Pole coal, and this was about a year and a half ago. Prices uh, have even gone down a little bit on the coal end. Um, about uh, a little over 100,000 BTUs per dollar, okay? And I don't care so much about the amounts as just comparing it to what else is available. If you go over to... Um, if you go over to Delta Junction and you pick up your own barley, and then it was, I think, 275 a ton is what they added at, um, you know, you came out just under 80,000 BTUs. So it was the second best option just to burn barley seed uh, grain in, your pellet, in a pellet-like stove. And then if you bought in little bags, of course, it wasn't as efficient, so you got a little less BTUs per dollar. But then if you went over to one of the big box stores and you got wood pellets, it turned out that you could come up with about 50,000 BTUs. So, so far, it looks as though straight across, coal is twice as, you get twice as many BTUs out of coal, a fossil fuel, than you do out of, um, uh, out of a biofuel here, just wood. All right, something that you can grow, something that will die and decay, and you can grow again. Now, people in the EU and different parts of Europe are real excited about biomass, mostly wood fuel anymore, uh, because when they do their accounting and they have to reach certain quotas or uh, certain um, ceilings that they can't go above for creating their electricity and their heat, um, if you're burning X amount of uh, tons of coal, uh, they count how much carbon dioxide is left off, okay? Uh, how much uh, enters the atmosphere from digging it out of the ground and then releasing it more or less from burning it up. But with trees or with plants, they don't look at it that way. In their accounting methods, they figure that those are carbon neutral. In other words, they say zero carbon uh, dioxide is given off. And the reason, uh, in just a nutshell, that they use that accounting method is because they figured that the plant is going to grow back, and it also has its own exchange process um, by just being a part in the living ecosystem of working with carbon dioxide. 
And so when utilities have to make a decision over what types of fuel, they have to look at cost over in Europe, but they also have to look at what are we limited to as far as the amount of carbon dioxide. So in this case, coal is king. However, as you go on down, if you look at fuel oil, which is preferred over coal in the sense that it also is a um, fossil fuel, but it's liquid. It's very easy to transport. You can, it's very condensed. The BTUs are in, in liquid form, so you don't have big gaps between coal chunks when you ship it with transportation costs as they are. But when you look at it, if you go ahead and go down to the big box store, and get wood pellets or go on over to the granary and get the barley, you're over you're getting twice as many B2 uses oil. And so in areas where maybe there um, where there's uh, oil readily available and oil burners and not so much coal, um, it isn't too difficult to swap these out and to put in uh, pellet stoves or wood stoves. Now, how did regular wood come out? Well, it depended. When you were at about $250 uh, for a quart of wood, um, it ended up that wood was right in here. Okay, So it was still uh, considerably more than oil, uh, but the pellets actually came out a little bit cheaper. The reason, I think, is that uh, lumber yards, I think, were writing off their books all the extra sawdust and stuff that you make pellets out of is waste. And all the scab sides of, of when they were cutting for board feet of a round log. And then it was, and then they would send it up here as, as waste in pellet form. They'd extrude it through a press or maybe mix it with some binder, the sawdust and the chunks, and basically come up with pellets. And uh, it was just kind of an extra value to what they already considered waste and that they probably had to pay for disposal at one time in the past, possibly. So anyway, this got me to really thinking about biomass, about the fact that, at least in the interior, um, if you can bundle together, whether it be grain or whether it be wood, you're coming out ahead. Now, biofuels in the lower 48 uh, have been looked at for quite a long time, and the main biofuel that had hit the commercial market, uh, I'd say, was ethanol, uh, coming out of the Midwest uh, in the uh, 80s and 90s. Um, and ethanol uh, was basically derived from corn. Now, the difficulty in the last couple of years with ethanol competing against even fuel oil, okay, is that ethanol being based on corn, um, you already have petroleum costs to run the machinery, the tractors and such, and corn was getting such a high price per bushel as a food commodity that it pretty much um, uh, outpriced in some senses uh, using corn for, you know, for uh, oil. In economics, often uh, you can use a good or a resource for, you know, several different uh, products but you want the one that at that time is going to pay the most. And in this case, um, with corn, there were also difficulties. They got the distilling process down well on how to go ahead and come up with a liquid type of fuel out of it. Um, but there were also some difficulties in the Midwest with uh, the amount of water that was used, uh, the way the plants were set up and such. So there was kind of an ethanol crash where there had been a lot of money invested in ethanol. And uh, as the price of uh, fuel oil went up in the mid-2000s or the latter mid-2000s, it looked really promising. And there's still ethanol in production today, don't get me wrong. But then when um, corn also went up like crazy, it kind of pushed it out of the market in some regards. Biofuels, though, can be not just from a grain like barley burning it raw or corn turning it into a fluid. Uh, but also algae. Um, I was at the International Biomass Conference last March and was surprised to see on these farmlands, but it has to be real specific conditions of humidity, amount of sunlight. They do some kind of artificial manipulation by covering with certain types of plastics to get algae to grow in stagnant water. And they would take a farm field 
and they would cut these large rows of ditches for just stagnant water to be in and just let the algae grow. And then they would gather up the algae and uh, would be able to go ahead and make it into a fuel. And then also, obviously, uh, animal, um, animal byproducts can be used uh, as a uh, biofuel also. Um, in particular, uh, salmon obviously has a lot of omega-3 oil, and we'll discuss a little bit later some research that came out of uh, the School for Natural Research and Agriculture here, where you can make, if you got a home blender and you got some salmon guts and a little bit of alder chips, you can actually make your own, um, your own uh, salmon fuel uh, bricks to throw into your fire, um, I guess. If you don't mind the smell of fish in your house, it comes off pretty well. But anyway, um, when we look at biofuels, uh, some can be pressed uh, for straight. Uh, when we're looking at uh, bioliquids specifically, um, some can be pressed for straight use in a traditional diesel engine. Uh, we'll talk about some of those plants that uh, people harvest the grains for and then press them just for the oil. And then some, like uh, barley, where you're not going to get any oil just due to the nature of the seed, uh, you can supply heat and power uh, by burning it. And usually the best way to burn it is in a very hot and rapid sense um, in a gasifier. But you can do it in traditional pellet stoves and wood stoves too. Uh, biofuels often uh, can be blended with diesel fuel. So the military um, has been experimenting for quite a while on trying to figure out how do we go ahead and um, uh, extend what petroleum we have at a certain location. Um, and they're trying to get a certain amount of renewable uh, bioliquids to run their fighter jets on even. And often it's a mix with uh, diesel and then the supplement from whatever plant or whatever um, algae source that it comes from. Um, I'm kind of informal, but I can't, unfortunately, I can't see your hands and such as that when I uh, go through the slideshow because i got to have it in front of me to advance it. So I'm going to just stop every couple uh, slides and hear if you got any questions any comments or any experiences that you want to pitch in there. Okay. Well, um, let me get back here to the uh, slideshow. Um, one of the reasons that the military has been looking for alternative ways of using fuel, and obviously, um, you know, uh, in the United States we've gotten – uh, good commercial benefits uh, after the fact, after the military or NASA has invented something. Remember Tang? Remember the little food sticks? That kind of thing. Well, uh, the military has been uh, looking at some uh, real unique ways of, believe it or not, uh, painting uh, tanks or vehicles with uh, solar paint, uh, so that it could, or having kind of retractable foldable solar pads so that it can turn uh, radiant electricity into electrons and help power things. Usually it's supplementary sources of, of uh, energy. Uh, but they also have been looking, like I said, with, the, um, with their uh, fleet at trying to get a certain amount of renewables in there. And in some cases it has to do with uh, the fact that during, uh, for instance, the Afghanistan war, it was very costly to get petroleum at its source, refined, um, to where it needed to be in a remote location. Okay? So if there are ways of extracting, of bringing in a wood gasifier, if you're in a very woody area where there's a lot of dead forage and stuff on the ground, um, where you can make biofuels, and we'll see one in this slideshow here in just a couple slides, um, it makes it much more efficient uh, to try to operate. The, co the average cost that I've seen from a reliable source, and this is a conservative figure, is that in Afghanistan, in the, uh, in the uh, kind of remote, the front line type of areas, when they went in, they averaged out their cost of fuel, and obviously they're figuring in 
not only refining and transportation, but the time and payroll of the people who it took to move it, okay? Um, they're looking at about $400 a gallon for operation. And if anybody ever has any questions um, on any of the figures I use or such, I can always get you uh, sources if you want to follow up and read more about it or such as that. So um, in some cases, uh, if you're going to have a remote setup, biofuels, if the resource is there, uh, and bioliquids in particular can be very handy. So what about Alaska? In Alaska, uh, there's a couple of different kinds of uh, seeds or uh, grains that could be pressed just to get the oil out of it. Uh, uh, one is uh, canola. And that was tried by one farmer in Delta Junction area. And I think that he had difficulty, but I think it was more with the, the seed itself. And there's rapeseed and camellia, uh, or camelina, I'm sorry. And that, uh, uh, I should put an N in there. I missed an N. But with camelina, um, that has been successful uh, in Montana, for instance. Now, uh, you know, with each type of strain of grain that you use or starter seed, um, you find the right hybrid that's going to fit the conditions where you're at. And with the camelina, um, it is a very good seed, and it has some real good potential qualities. Unfortunately, because of the nature of our daylight, the shorter season, but then a lot of sunlight all at once, uh, it's been fairly limiting so that it hasn't been cost. We can grow it. It just isn't cost effective uh, from the viewpoint of how far the seed matures, how much oil we can extract from it, and then our costs into planting and harvesting. Um, but uh, as I mentioned, algae can be used. Even soybeans can be used for oils. And gasified wood. Now, what I mean by gasified wood, and this is an illustration of a machine that um, I don't know if you guys are uh, familiar at all with. Right. Yeah. yeah. We, we are not seeing the slideshow right now. Oh, you're not? It's okay. not on our screen. Okay, okay. well, you'll want to see this. So let me go back and make sure. Let me go back and re-choose it. Um, thank you for letting me know. Okay. Yeah, it looks like it fell off. I mean, I've seen it in front of me. Hold on, and uh, let's see here. Hmm. Okay. Okay, I'm going to try something, and let me know if this works. I'm going to uh, un unslide it, so to speak. Let's see if I can do this. Uh, I'm going to unchoose it and then rechoose it again, I guess. Owl, okay, let's do this, jabber, um, let me ask you this, can you see a, um, uh, a document that says uh, CES Brown Bag Energy Workshops Owl Network? Uh, just yep. a word now document. Okay, I'm yep. going to go ahead and scrap that then. Now that I know that that that, that worked, and I'm going to stop sharing that, and then we'll see here with Jabber. We'll try this. There. Okay, I think I found out what the problem is. Can you see it now? Yep, we got it. Okay, and then let me make sure I can still advance the slides. So let me ask you this. Um, you, is the slide in front of you right now one called Biofuel Facts? It is. Okay, good. So um, this slide is, the I think, probably the main one that you missed. I really haven't had a lot of pictures so far, except for this unit right now. You should be looking at something that kind of looks like it came off of Lost in Space or some type of old sci-fi show like that. Uh, gasification Experimental Kit. That's yeah, showing up. Okay. okay, so here's the deal. 
there uh, apparently there's a big uh, kind of uh, uh, event down in the southwest called Burning Man where you get a lot of artisans and a lot of folks who uh, come together and they uh, have I've never been to it uh, I wouldn't want to mischaracterize it but it sounds like it's just kind of a big bash out in the desert and uh, for one of those events they realizing they needed power guys who were handy with arc welders and such um, and knew of the concepts of gasification went ahead and created um, a gasification experimental kit called a GEC. And they basically found ordinary things around that they could put gasoline in, I mean, uh, excuse me, wood chips, or in this case it was out of Berkeley, California, and they decided that they would put um, wasted uh, walnut shells and pecan shells uh, after the nuts had been extracted, and they would burn it. And they would burn it so hot, furious, and fast uh, that they would go ahead and basically turn the, uh, uh, except for just a tiny bit of ash, they would turn all the product into a gas. Now, when you throw a log on the fire and it's just an open fireplace, about 50% of your BTUs go up in the air as gases and vapor. And in this case, they captured it um, in this cylinder down in the lower left. Uh, it's a, this is called a cyclonic gasification unit. And uh, they used those gases and ported them over to, on the right of this uh, pallet, so to speak, power pallet this is called, because it's the size of a regular wood pallet. To the, to the right you'll see kind of a brown uh, radiator. That's on the backside of a Chevy engine. So in the drum, 55-gallon drum, they would burn anything that burned wood, nutshells, even uh, turkey poop. Whatever would burn, they would cram it in there. It would get that cylinder of the lower left so hot that, and with the cyclonic method that they had of air induction and such, they would port the gases over to the engine, they would fire up the engine, and then they had an alternator on it, and they would produce current. And people would plug in, and they had kind of a, a, a large, albeit, but a mobile um, type of device where you just feed in waste stock and you get electricity out of it. Now, they decided that this was so cool that they went ahead and put the plans online. And if you go to their website, All Powered Labs, it'll even say that these are experimental kits and they have the CAD drawings so you can do it at home. But as, as they kind of perfected this for the third world, they found that it wasn't really practical to be fielding for free everybody's phone calls who called them while they were working on their own stuff. Um, and people were work, working with different kinds of metals and they were experimenting with different uh, types of components. So finally they decided to go into business and just produce these things. So for instance, here's a power pallet that's not their latest, but you can buy that for about, um, I think it's 15 grand. And it puts out uh, three, uh, three kilowatts, which would power, um, would power a house, a good-sized house. And then they have a 10 kilowatt that would do like a small, uh, really small school or tribal hall. And then they also have now a 20 kilowatt, which would be good for a business. And um, for a while, you could only feed... Every two and a half hours, and this is the problem when you're not working with liquids and you're working with biomass that's solids, they had to feed that, that barrel um, full of waste. Uh, but now they've got it down to an effect where apparently on their newest unit, I just watched a webcast on Friday right from Berkeley uh, from their labs or uh, maybe they're in a different part of California now. Um, they were able to go ahead and keep that thing going 24 hours, 24 hours. And the cost comes out at about a kilowatt an hour, okay? Uh, I mean, excuse me, uh, a dollar, a dollar for a kilowatt, uh, which seems uh, maybe high by standards of Fairbanks at about a quarter for a kilowatt. You know, it's four times as high. But when you're off grid, uh, this thing really works well. Um, and if you already have waste product you have to get rid of, if you have a log, a log logging operation, and nobody wants the sawdust and it's getting in your way or, or scabs or something like that, you can throw them in and you can dispose of them and get power off of it. 
and obviously it's mobile. Now, on this kind of unit, if you want to. We've got a oh, question here in Haynes. Yeah, you bet. Yeah, yeah what, what are you using to create the, um, what, what initial fuel are you using to burn the uh, bioproducts to begin with? So the way they have, I've not seen the ignition system on it, but it does have, believe it or not, a diehard battery on it. When I saw it in Minneapolis at a show, um, they have, um, and I can uh, refer you to their newsletter, they have an ignition system that I think is working off of a 12-volt battery, I believe. And then they're starting the fire, and this is, and here's where your feedstock is, is in the drum. The problem they've been having in the past that they think they've gotten around is how do you go ahead and keep the feedstock on the bottom on fire at a rate that it's not going to totally consume everything in here or smolder from the weight of the other feedstock and then block things up. That's been my understanding. So it does have an ignition system. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So here's what I wanted to get at, though, is that when you put the gases, when you go ahead and, and burn this hot and heavy uh, and you put it through the cyclonic, um, oh, uh, cyclonic, not generator, the cyclonic burner, we'll call it, there's a little tap. And you can go ahead and uh, cool the thing down after you've gasified all the bio uh, material. You can cool it down and then draft off or tap off liquid, liquid fuel. You can have a copper pipe. Well, I don't know if it would be copper. Maybe it would be stainless steel. Pipe coming off of the tap and have a cooling system and condense it into fuel. Now, the question is, um, with all the junk that you threw in here, um, will, you know, would a normal car, you know, uh, engine run off of this, uh, uh, basically syngas or wood gas, which much of Europe uh, operated off uh, during um, World War II. And uh, a little prior, you can find pictures in Germany during the 30s and 40s of cars operating off of wood being put basically into a burner in the back of the car and uh, just running off the gases. But there were also syngas products where you would uh, liquidi liquidify it. And um, I don't know. I don't know what kind of refining process you'd have to do uh, to pour the liquids in and not muck things up in a regular engine. But I do know that, uh, so this is an, ex an example of gasification. Um, I do know that um, the, there are uh, industry standards, okay, uh, so that if you do have a bioliquid of some kind and it meets the ASTM 6751 standards, um, it's going to probably uh, be just fine burning in your engine. Now, having said that, some people have said, well, you know, from a practical matter, you can take camelina and you can press, you can press the seed and take the oil off of it and run it straight in your diesel truck. And this is true. You, you can do that. And I believe you can also do that uh, depending on what type of filters you have on the press with canola. The problem is, is that even though it will fire, um, uh, there are, depending on um, the processing that you're doing for the, uh, for the seeds uh, as you're pressing them, you might add something like methyl hydrate uh, to go ahead and basically um, work with uh, natural... Um, glycol, or not glycol, but uh, glycerol and such like that in the oils, um, you may end up uh, damaging the seals, uh, the rubber seals in an engine. So it's always been uh, told to me that even though on a lot of these, from a practical point of view, the engine will run, you can drive the car um, straight off a of pressing right in your garage, a bunch of seeds, um, you really want to titrate it. Um, and I've been told by one of our professors who's pretty sharp on this stuff, if you had three tanks, you started with a fuel tank of just diesel, and you went through your tank, and then you maybe put in about a third of the fuel that you got off of oil seed and mixed that with two-thirds diesel, it gives the engine, um, it gives the carbon deposits 
and the uh, seals time to, I guess, adjust more or less. And it keeps you from having crud that, uh, I believe it's the glycerol, I, I believe, um, in those uh, seed oils could also strip away chunky deposits that have built up over time. And, of course, when those come loose, it's like a blood clot. Um, you, you, don't, you don't want that stuff floating around and getting into your, into your uh, firing system and such. And uh, so usually you can, um, in three tanks full of gas, you can get to the point of just using total uh, seed fuel. It's possible. Now, again, I think it's going to be dependent on what kind of seed oil you're using, but camelina seems to be a good one. The other thing that you can do also is you can take uh, waste vegetable oil uh, from folks who maybe have a fast food restaurant and have a lot of fries and stuff like that, and you can strain out all the crispy critters, so to speak, and you can, uh, you can burn that uh, in a regular diesel engine usually. Now, um, the problem usually uh, falls into the realm, and there's a gal here at the Alaska Center of Energy and Power is the director who has two tanks on her car. She has one to pour uh, strained vegetable oil into, and then she has one that she has for just regular, you know, uh, fossil fuel diesel. Um, and she can actually switch from tank to tank mid-trip. I think she pulls over and switches, I imagine. But the problem is, is that Petrol will go down to about 35 degrees below, number one, before it starts to gel. Fuel or vegetable oil gels much sooner. So usually people who modify their vehicles and put these tanks in, uh, they usually um, have some type of heating device to keep it heated uh, so that it doesn't um, solidify because the solidification level of vegetable oil, vegetable oil, um, I think is around 20. It's above zero, but I believe it's just below freezing. Um, that, that's my understanding. So that's something that you have to take in consideration. Now, there's a guy in North Pole here, or, or Fairbanks, who runs uh, diesel equipment uh, uh, for paving. He's a construction guy. And he gets 40,000 gallons delivered to him for free of waste vegetable oil. He has a more expensive filtering system than most would use for residential. And he runs his equipment off it, and he figures by the time he's fit. Now, again, it's delivered to his door. He doesn't have to go collect it. It's an outfit that has a large, um, a large cafeteria system that in the past would have had to have paid to dispose of it. So they just bring it straight to his house. He figures it costs him about two bucks a gallon to run his equipment off this waste vegetable oil. And uh, this fall I was in Iceland um, in their second largest city, which is about the size of Fairbanks. And um, they had uh, a, a plant uh, to get all the vegetable oil that they could. And, uh, you know, if you even go through Fairbanks, there's not that many restaurants really. Um, and so it was a fairly small plant, but they had different vats that they were treating and filtering and probably doing, uh, adding some additives to the, uh, uh, to the vegetable oil also. So in some states, um, you know, there might be regulations and such like that uh, with waste vegetable oil or just straight vegetable oil. Um, in using it for commercial vehicles and such. Uh, in Alaska, I don't believe there's any type of regulation on it whatsoever. A fellow over in Cordova, who's a, a heating and plumbing guy, he's gotten really good at figuring out so that you can get a good flow of oil and get the most, I guess, least amount of emissions and the most amount of BTUs out of it. He's figured out quite a method beyond just straining the crispy stuff out, of adding uh, different uh, chemical components and then pulling them back out, pulling them back out uh, before the combustion process. So there's been some experimentation in Alaska. Um, any questions at all on, on any of that? 
I went, I met, and you can see the uh, slideshow okay now, right? Yeah, we can see it. Okay. So um, I mentioned that with this whole oil seed processing, um, generally um, the reason why it's cost effective for most locations is they get the cheap oil, but they wouldn't be able to make it on their own because there's separation process and presses cost money. Uh, so they also make money off of the value of the leftover meal the leftover dried husks and uh, meat of the various seeds. And in some cases, um, in some cases, uh, you know, you have to find a market for the meal uh, that's uh, going to pay you enough to basically keep the whole operation going. Now, um, in Cordova, um, I've talked to them a little bit about maybe using some of their salmon guts at the canneries uh, for basically uh, mixing in a slurry with wood chips from a local lumber yard and uh, making um, hard bricks for people to burn. And there is a market for things called bio bricks. Um, and in that case, uh, for Cordova, it really wasn't cost effective. And the reason why was that they had these extra fish guts left over uh, that you may need to dispose of even. There's tighter regulations now, I think, from the EPA. It used to be when I worked in canneries in Valdez, you just had a big hole and just dumped them into the harbor. But then there's different effluent problems and such. Um, so now uh, canneries are having to look, in some cases, at figuring out what they're going to do with all this extra salmon carcasses and the guts and everything. Well, in Cordova, it really wasn't cost effective to try to utilize energy out of it, out of BTUs out of the waste, because um, they have uh, a pharmaceutical company come in and somehow extract oil from the carcasses. And then it sells as a high-value item because it's put into capsules as a mega-3, good for your brain, and sold in health food stores. So again, there's this problem when you come up with uh, a resource that you have at hand uh, that you can use, um, there's often competing alternative uses for it, even with something that's considered a waste. And um, so anyway, uh, it, it also depends uh, with uh, some of the uh, oil seed products, uh, such as uh, canola, or camelina and such like that, when you end up with the waste, often it ends up, um, or the meal rather, it ends up uh, getting a little more complicated than you might have thought. So for instance, generally you have a mechanical press that will press maybe up to 30 ton 300 tons rather of seed a day. And then uh, when you've pressed, you have a tray, the one I've seen, uh, that used to be under my office that smelled the high heaven. It always smelled like I was walking into a, a barn because it smelled like cow meal because they were pressing canola. You have a tray that goes ahead and just uh, sips off the uh, oils, and then the rest of the meal, they would mix back in with canola, um, as I recall, uh, as feed. Okay? So you get this process going. You use, you use oil maybe the canola oil that you extracted last year, uh, but you need to have, obviously, additives so that it doesn't go rancid. You burn it in your tractor to go ahead and plant canola, and then you harvest the canola, you press it, you use some of the canola oil from that probably to sell off, some in your tractor for planting and harvesting, and then with the meal, you go ahead and you have another subsidiary business, livestock and such, that you feed it to. What they found out with um, camelina meal in uh, Montana was that they couldn't uh, take the meal and give it to livestock that was going to be for human consumption. The FDA stepped in. Because in some cases, um, it can compromise the livers of the animals, they felt, and they weren't sure about it, the FDA. And if people were going to eat that meat or drink the milk from the livestock that ate that meal, 
they were afraid that the liver wouldn't function correctly and that there would be uh, problems with the, uh, the meat and the milk for humans. So in this case, uh, they had to go to bat uh, against uh, a veterinary board, more or less, and try to convince this veterinary board, the uh, growers of canola or the university researchers, um, you know, as to how far the dangers could or wouldn't go. So that's a case where, again, you've got two product, you've got to find a good market for both where you're not going to have too much regulation. So here's a picture of a very simple extractor. Now, like I mentioned earlier, um, you might even use the outside shell and not the meat. With cannoli, you throw the whole thing in, you get your oil, and then you just got this ground up stuff. Um, but with sunflower seeds, for instance, I used to live in the Red River Valley, was with extension there. Um, they would extract the sunflower, and you can get sunflower oil out of sunflower seeds from the kernel. And then the shells, they would take over to the local, um, the local city-owned uh, swimming pool, and they had a, uh, a furnace in there with this huge auger off a silo, and they would just burn to keep warm in the winter. Uh, they would burn the sunflower shells and not even the meat or the meal and not even any oil. I mentioned a little bit about different solvents uh, that you can use uh, to try to extract more of the oils out of the meal uh, or make them ro more robust. Um, sometimes, again, you have to make sure that whatever machinery you're going to use, the actual fuel in the solvents aren't going to cause problems. Um, in in uh, canola being a big one, uh, in the western states, if you have 100 acres and you grow canola, you can get uh, 55 tons um, of actual seed, and that gives you about 4,200 gallons of actual oil. And then you've got this meal that you have to do something with. Now, any questions so far? I see that we have about 10 minutes, so I'll try to step it up a little bit. Any? Okay. The, uh, the yeah. salmon and the, the alder chips or whatever you're talking about, is the wood necessary to get that stuff to burn once it's dried? Well, what the wood does is that it, the wood acts as a binder so that, uh, you know, we'll zip forward to that, and I'll show you... Um, I'll try to describe it better in the next slide or two. How's that? Uh, it it, it uh, slows the burn, kind of like fiber, uh, slowing down food going through the body. Nutrients can be leached out. Um, but uh, uh, I've never heard of trying to do – where they try to use the guts as a biofuel um, without any alder, is sometimes they'll go ahead and with cattle uh, chips, cattle waste, manure, uh, or fish guts in some areas, they'll put kind of a big container over it and they'll let it rot. And then they'll take uh, gas, just a gaseous vapor form, and they'll burn that. Basically methane, methane. So that's the only uh, extraction I've heard of fish guts where they'll use it without the wood and such is when they're trying to burn it in some type of gas form. And then they're not even burning the actual guts, they're just burning the gases? That's my understanding. You have a you have kind of a capture capsule, more or less, that uh, captures the gas and just pours it off as a vapor. So it sounds like the wood chips are kind of working like a wick in an oil lamp would work to help slow the burn and focus it when it's all mixed? Yeah, I've never had it explained to me but, uh, exactly, but I believe that's the case. I believe that's the case. And it also acts as a binder, you know. Um, so well, let's just jump right now to the fish example. Andrew Soria, S-O-R-I-A, and you could look online, and the Agra Borealis, I think, is a magazine that's published out of UAF. You could find it online. He did a little experiment. And he went ahead and he mixed uh, so much, out of 100% of material he did, so much percent guts, so much percent uh, alder chip, okay? And really fine chip, I believe. And um, then he burned it. Huh? Like chainsaw chips? I believe they were smaller than that, but I'd have to see in the article um, if he specifies. 
Plus, I've got Andy's number. I can always give him a call and ask if he had any questions. But they went ahead and they basically threw the guts in a blender and the chips in the blender, all right? And then it's a slurry and it's wet, right? They poured it out, kind of, I believe, into molds, and then they let it dry off, let it go ahead. And I don't know if they had any kind of mechanical heating or drying for that. And then you end up with this brick uh, that, yeah, with all those chips and stuff, it snaps or it, it doesn't just totally crumble apart because it's dried fish guts, right? I mean, you've got this fiber in there. And um, what he found was that when he burned for the heat to use, there was something about the process that the optimal amount to get the most BTU, same amount of junk, but different com compositions, 50% fish guts, 50% uh, alder, you know, 10% fish guts, 90% alder. He found out that for some reason on the burn, a 29% fish gut, if I recall right, and 71% alder was the best mix. So it's it's uh, almost uh, three quarters uh, wood chip yeah, anyway. Getting rid of that much fish guts in the process here, are you burning more more wood than? Yeah, yeah, by almost three quarter, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Almost a three quarter to one quarter ratio, and and he didn't have to do it that way. Like I said, he could experiment with different mixes and go heavy on the fish guts, but there was something about just. When it was put together, he got the best burn out of it. So, And I think he's got a pretty good article. I thought I had it on top of my desk, but I think it's called Gas. Um, you can contact me. i got information at the end. You can certainly contact me, and I can forward you the PDF because I've got it on my uh, computer. Okay. But, um, yeah, yeah. So, in general, when we look at a, a gallon of diesel fuel, uh, depending on who your diesel distributor is, They'll say it's anywhere from about 129,000 to 133,000 BTUs per gallon. Biodiesel um, often has less less BTUs. Um, so here, the National Biodiesel Board, which is I am assuming averaging all sorts of diesel, is saying it comes out to about 120 on the bio and about 130 on regular diesel. So you don't necessarily get as much bang for a gallon of it. Um, but again, such as the guy in, in Fairbanks, if he's only paying two bucks, um, he's good to go, even if he only gets 120 instead of 130, right? Because that's a cost differential of two bucks versus what at the time I think was four bucks for the for the actual diesel. So um, here's a, a sample recipe that shows that um, in biodiesel, uh, often you do add in different catalysts, chemicals. You do add in different types of alcohol or glycerol uh, to try to get it to run smoothly, either uh, so that it will flow smoothly in an engine or so that it uh, keeps its BTU power. Um, here's an example here of uh, a guy from uh, Montana State University um, who has basically taken the product that you would think of as squeezed and uh, he's showing kind of the uh, breakdown when it separates. So uh, this seed, I don't know what kind of seed that is, but they've pressed that seed, and this is probably the majority of what they've got, and then they've also got glycerol, glycerin rather, not glycerol. So um, uh, the only thing I want to say about this slide is that when people look at scale on possibly doing uh, a bio a bio liquid type of uh, project, they have to do a sensitivity analysis where they're figuring in again um, what money they're going to get for the meal, what for the seed, then their cost, their labor, and their crushing. And again, this is somewhat dependent upon the price of pe uh, possibly petrol because in their operation, unless they plow back into their process some of their own some of their own oils, a, a factory or a refinery of these type of oils may still be using diesel for transportation in trucks from the fields, possibly some for the tractors, possibly some in the actual factory. So, um, 
the only thing to get out of this slide is that as the production of biodiesels has gone up and then down, so has the amount of exports. So it looks like if you look at the uh, ratio of this to this or this to this, this to this, this to this, crudely it looks like on a dependent year, except for 2005, uh, up to 2006, but post-2006, it looks like you're using, you know, you're, you're you're using maybe two-thirds to a half of the actual biodiesels locally, and then you're shipping the rest off. And what countries those will go to, I'm not sure. The other thing that I just wanted to point out, and I'm not so concerned about this premium price, is that, again, there's kind of this correlation. Now, there's some burps and bumps where biodiesel is actually cheaper than diesel, but because of the production process and needing to rely on on diesel in general, and it being a, a complementary product, often we're mixing the two, um, pretty much the prices ups and downs, the trend fits together of fossil fuel diesel and biodiesel. Now, here's that article I mentioned, and it looks like we're going to get clipped off here in about two minutes, so I just want you to write this down if you're interested. Gasification of salmon with red alder, and it's by Friedis uh, Soria, Andrew Soria and Bauer. It's 2010. They're throwing in the heads everything. They've got a gasifier. They're using uh, wood charcoal, uh, one of those GEX, and they're gasifying this stuff. And there's your 21% salmon. They're, they're, you know, they're getting up to 800 degrees, 79% um, alder pellets, and... Um, this was in a case, actually this doesn't, this looks like this may be another experiment, I'm sorry, from Andy on gasification. I'll need to double check and see if that's the same article where he mentions them making the actual bricks. And by bricks, I don't mean they're real large for experimental purposes, and I suppose they were probably like the size of a, a Reese's peanut butter cup or something like that. Um... And then I mentioned bio-waste. Often uh, you can put a capturing bubble over uh, cow manure or other, uh, other ways to drive a turbine from the gases that you collect. Very intensive and expensive as far as the capital. And I just wanted to mention that there are different types of combustion engines. Uh, there's the internal that we know, but a Rankine cycle engine is used up here at China Hot Springs. And it has uh, different requirements um, as a Stirling engine, which has been around for, I believe, over 100 years. So often you match the technology. Here's a picture of what I was mentioning with uh, aerobic digestion of bio-waste. You have a cover and you have extraction. Um, I think we're going to cut off here any moment. Any questions anyone would like to ask? This is my no, uh, but thank you. Yeah, yeah, this is my address and phone number. Now, I can't remember what we got going next week, but you might want to take a look at the OWL Network list to see what I did last month and the month before because I've done, uh, by the time it's all sent down, 15 different one-hour workshops on different aspects of Alaskan energy, some real practical like this and applied if you want to go ahead and grow some seed in the back of your garden. Uh, but some of it also looking at things from a kind of macro statewide perspective. Well, I appreciate next you week joining is the, in. Next week is Emerging Energies in Alaska, Art. Okay, so that will tell you some of the latest that we've been learning out of Alaska Energy Center for Energy and Power, some kind of cutting edge technology of different types of energy uh, extraction. Thanks again. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank yep. And feel free to call me at any time. I help out with technical assistance, and if I don't know where the answer is, I can part you to another researcher or someone in the university who is dealing with it. 